If you're intrigued by the mysteries of the unknown, you can investigate thousands on Discovery Plus. With exclusive originals and a scary big collection of favorites, Discovery Plus is the streaming home of paranormal classics like Ghost Adventures and Ghost Brothers, plus new originals like Amityville Horror House. Uncover hidden secrets and explore other worldly realms for just $4.99. Discovery Plus is the streaming home of paranormal, plus so much more. Start your free trial. I'm John Batchelor. This is the new John Batchelor Show, CBS Audio Network, Anchorage, Alaska, the scene of a sharp exchange between representatives of the People's Republic of China and the new Secretary of State and the new National Security Advisor for the United States for the Biden administration. The words were blunt. However, there is an interpretation that's needed here. And Wei Feng Zhang of the Mercatus Center joins me to help understand the sharp language, the undiplomatic language in Ang- Anchorage. And first of all, who was Mr. Yang talking to? Who was the audience for those remarks about how the U.S. is done and China is the power? Wei Feng, a very good evening to you. The audience for this is a surprise. Who was listening and how did they hear those sharp remarks? Good evening to you. Good evening to you, John, and thanks for having me. That's a very interesting question because I think it's important for a high-profile meeting like this one it's important to understand who, uh, to whom the diplomats are speaking to. And obviously, they are talking to each other. But on the Chinese side, I think a very important uh, audience uh, is actually the domestic, the, the people in China, and also the potential allies China is trying to build, uh, in, especially in the developing world. And so projecting strength like this, it would, on the one hand, justify that they are the legitimate rulers of the uh, Chinese regime, and on the other hand, it's also profitable, at least, to build alliance with China because China is just as good as an alternative to the United States. The message then of China surpassing the United States, that was for consumption, domestic consumption, but also for those states around the world that might be wavering in their choices. Is that the way to understand this? This was a sales pitch to the unseen. Yeah, it's absolutely a sales pitch. But I, I think it's also, uh, by, by the way, um, on the subject of vaccine diplomacy, too, it would be very helpful for the Chinese regime to project uh, strength and uh, being a good alternative to the, U, to, to the United States to be able to have a successful uh, vaccine diplomacy. And as we know, it's not you know, uh, go, going as well as they, uh, they were hoping for. But more generally, I think it is true that uh, when, we, when we get to uh, – Meetings like this, it's important to understand that there's a sales pitch side of it. But it's also important to note that uh, for a sales pitch to be credible, you, you also uh, need substance, right? And I think in these days, China, China does have the substance to back up their sales pitch because I think there are certain elements of the Chinese economy in the future could uh, still keep going in the same way it does and pose uh, more and more concerns to the free world. You wrote trenchantly about Hong Kong in late March. Hong Kong continues to suffer under the heavy hand of the mainland. Detentions, uh, people disappearing, trials mentioned, lengthy sentences. In fact, incidents of breaking up uh, rival media organizations with hammers, all kinds of horrors. You, You write that in late March that was not... An end game. That was a starting game. How so, Wei Feng? And how does that connect to this aggression in Anchorage? It's a. It's important to note that it's a starting game in the following sense: that Hong Kong is really the first time I think that China has to use uh, tactics to manipulate system to infiltrate a system, uh, the Hong Kong system that that was supposed to be very different from the mainland Chinese system. And so uh, two pre- Chinese presidents ago, China had the policy that central government officials were not supposed to meddle with affairs in Hong Kong. But that started to change in president, former President Hu Jintao's administration, and much more so now under President Xi Jinping. And so the tactics they have been deploying is uh, through propaganda and what we can broadly call the United Front effort, uh, basically to build alliances in Hong Kong to try to turn Hong Kong to be more and more pro-Beijing. So obviously it's working, but I think it's, 
U.S. policymakers should be paying more attention to Hong Kong than they already are, because that's where we can learn how China operates. Because this is the learning experience for uh, the Chinese policymakers. This is their first time they are trying to do this, and if it works, obviously it does. They will try to deploy the same game on other places like Taiwan, Australia, New Zealand, and other important airlines of the United States, including uh, the United States for sure. And so. Um, the fact that, you know, when we look at Hong Kong, yes, it's terrible to see what's happened there. But it's also important to actually learn what the tactics the Chinese government are, uh, is using. And I think that will be very important intelligence information for the U.S. Uh, policymakers as well. To your understanding, was Beijing surprised how easy it was, how there wasn't a sharp pushback, how there wasn't condemnation and boycotts and sanctions? Did that surprise them? I think they. I, I don't know whether they're surprised, but I'm. I'm sure they're very pleasant. Uh, they think this is a very pleasant. Uh, they are very pleased about the experience so far, because the pushback they are getting from international community is uh, decreasing, in my opinion. Uh, two years ago, when there were uh, protests in Hong Kong, they got a lot of pushback, especially from the United States, but from other of its allies too. But like this year, the China rolled out multiple policies to crush further crush freedom in Hong Kong. And they haven't uh, faced any consequences so far. So I think it's there are some minor sanctions on individual officials who they, uh, the U.S. and its allies consider responsible for the crackdown. But we're only talking about a handful of people. The entire regime has faced no consequence. So I think they, uh, in my opinion, I think they're very pleased by how much progress, quote unquote, progress they are making in turning the system in Hong Kong. And yet you mentioned that they they remain concerned about an alliance op, uh, of the opposition, the United States, Great Britain, France, Germany. There are many people who have doubts about their policy in Xinjiang. The vulnerable po point seems to be the Olympics. Does that, does that weigh upon Beijing? Is the Olympics an opportunity uh, to do it right where uh, Hong Kong was done wrong? I don't think they think what they did in Hong Kong was wrong. It's, it was a success uh, from the Chinese pers perspective in terms of changing the Chinese, uh, changing the Hong Kong system. The, it's interesting to think about the Olympic Games because there are proposals among Western nations to say, let's boycott China. Right. And that might be a way to pressure them to change what they're doing in the Uyghur region of Xinjiang. I don't think that's, uh, that would, that would work out actually. It's, uh, because if you pull out, uh, the talking point, the uh, the main, mainland Chinese residents, many of them, they don't know what's happening in Xinjiang. So if Western nations pull out, they, the Chinese government would have a great opportunity to to roll out propaganda saying that this is the Western society trying to isolate us and look how much success we're doing in this with this Olympic Games. It would actually increase popularity of the Chinese president at home. So I don't think that that's actually a good idea. Instead, what uh, Western nations should do is to go and uh, speak their mind when they're interviewed, when they're interviewed during the games and try to, uh, pro you, you could protest uh, when you're attending the game rather than not going at all, which would be uh, just giving them talk more talking points. There is a suggestion in what you present that the Communist Party is anxious about an alliance against it. Let me name one alliance, for example, in these last years, the Quad, India, Australia, Japan, and the United States. Does that... Is that a model of what will work to, to stem the regime's aggression? I think it is. It, it should be in the future. The U.S. policymakers should really think about building different types of alliances on different issues. The Quad is an excellent way to approach the vaccine diplomacy, uh, to, to actually counter the vaccine diplomacy on the Chinese side, because India is a major vaccine producer. Because if, you, if we don't really... Uh, do something as an alliance together. China now, as of this month, is the largest producer of uh, COVID-19 vaccines and also exporters of COVID-19 vaccines. So uh, the, the effort on the Chinese side is very real. And I think it would be a very practical approach in the future for you, for the U.S. to build different lines of alliances on different issues. There, you, you could build an alliance on the vaccine front, and then you can do something else for other issues. Wei Feng, was the, was the exchange in Anchorage, Anchorage, in your opinion, was that a success? Because it was presented here as an ambush. Was that a success to show China launching a sneak attack on a, dipl on a diplomat? It was a success from, 
the Chinese people were very happy about the performance of the diplomats. Right. The, the, you mentioned Mr. Yang Jiechi. He's a very experienced diplomat, and he has dealt with the Americans for many, many years. And so when he said that, uh, you know, we are not going to take uh, this approach from the U.S., and uh, we are not going to be afraid of, of the economic powers by, by the United States, and the Chinese people actually love what he said. So in terms of domestic, domestic serving domestic audience, I think it turned out to be a success. And uh, I, I don't take I don't uh, tend to take too much out of meetings, like high profile meetings like this, because it's not like they will achieve much in terms of the bilateral negotiations. Right. And all the purposes they serve is just to to say what the the uh, a targeted audience want to hear. For example, say what the Chinese people like to hear. Weifeng Zhang of the Mercatus Center responding to the Chinese Communist Party claim that it has or will surpass the United States in power. I'm John Batchelor. This is the new John Batchelor Show, CBS Audio Network. Lowe's knows you work hard to take on the toughest jobs. So why not treat yourself with savings on the top pro tools that work as hard as you do? Head into Lowe's today for pro summer savings and get up to 30% off select tools and accessories. Lowe's is the home for great values on the most trusted brands like DeWalt, Bosch, and Metabo HPT. Shop in-store or on Lowe's.com. Lowe's, the new home for pros. While supplies last, about through 7-7, U.S. only. Some cars are comfy on the inside but don't have power on the outside. And some cars have the horsepower but none of the comfort. I used to think there weren't any cars that were the total package. But that all changed when I got my Honda SUV. It's rugged and sophisticated. And right now, Honda has deals on the entire Honda SUV lineup. CRV, HRV, Pilot, Passport, you name it. So if you're looking for a car that's the total package, the only place you'll find it is at your local Honda dealer. Hurry before they're all gone.